Andy, I am so glad to have you in the room this morning. Good, good crowd today and, and out there. Thank you for watching wherever you are. Speaking of, I'd like to give a shout out to Marsha. Marsha is uh, watching today. She's never been in this room, though. The reason being, Marsha lives in California, but she's watching. She started watching, so we want to give you a shout out, Marsha, and thank you for being. And, and everybody else, there are monitors there to help you with your experience and guide you if we can help you at the end of this in any way uh, regarding your spiritual life, please just let us know. And first time guests here, we are especially excited to have you here today. Hope to get to know you out at the tent afterwards a little bit and give you something for coming today as uh, we did with some at the earlier hour also. About a year ago, my wife had a conversation with someone she was an acquaintance of, didn't know her extremely well, but they did know each other. And um, the door opened a little bit in the conversation, and Sherry said, well, that's great. Why don't you come to our church? I'd love to have you come attend the church where we are. And the lady said, no, thanks. I'm not religious. And Sherry said, well, neither am I. And the lady went, I thought your husband was a pastor. And she said, well, yeah, he is. But really, we find this more about relationship than it is being religious. And she broke that out on her uh, for a couple of minutes, and I thought that was a, a great um, explanation that she gave, and it kind of gives me a reason to tell you one reason it is so important that in this day and age, we are all about the relationship with Christ more so than religion. There are two big enemies of the work of God today that kind of take the gospel into a fake gospel, or the as Paul said, the gospel without the, a form of gospel without the power of it. And they are this. They are legalism and, and uh, relativism. So let's take both of these just for a minute. Relativism, and a lot of people have given such good insight that are theologians or sociologists even far better than me, but I've taken some of what they're saying. Relativism basically says we are following the movement of the culture so therefore, we're going to shape our religion and shape our form of truth based on the culture or based on um, intellectual things that we now have discovered. That by itself takes you out of the true gospel, the good news about Jesus, and puts you into where salvation is what you do. It's about you rather than Jesus at that point because you You've exited the arena of that because what you're saying is, I'll determine what ultimately the standard is and what truth is. And that may shift from time to time because, see, the culture is discipling me, not the, not the words of God. And so it also sets you up to, a, to a, an idolatry of pride because to do that, you got to compare yourself to people who are not where you are, Right? You elevate your standing by diminishing other people who believe differently. That's why it's so relativistic and all. It's a matter of pride. So to put it, since football started in the last couple of days, let me try to put it into football terms. This is where somebody lost yesterday. The coach, though, at the press conference says, yeah, we were dancing and celebrating in the locker room because actually we didn't lose. Well, yeah, they had more points on the scoreboard, 
but we decided that a touchdown is now nine points, not six points. So if you redo the math, we won. We won. As, as stupid as that sounds, that's kind of what we see a lot of happening in our culture today. So legalism is a little bit different, whereas relativism, remember the story of the prodigal son? This is that younger son who says, wait a minute, time out, I don't want to work anymore. I think I have a better idea. That was okay until I got smart enough to realize this is basically slave labor. You owe me my inheritance now, Father. I'm going to take it, and I'm going to use it more wisely than you would, and I'm going to do what I want because there's a new standard now in town, and he does it. Legalism is where you, you're not there. You're following rules and structure and the law, and now it's not so much pride, but is, it is an ideology of fear. Because you know, as a sinner, I got to really, really button it up. I got to keep the rules so well and the laws so well that I don't mess up because my salvation is depending on that. It's, again, a self-salvation, but it's based on fear. And you don't compare yourself that much to other people except to know that you're not going to be a part of it. You can't be tainted by the outside world so we better close ranks, and we better play it close to the vest, and we better huddle up in here and support and protect each other because, hey, it's a bad world out there, and we're earning our way to heaven. This is the elder brother in the prodigal son because he keeps all the rules, doesn't he? He does the work. He doesn't rebel. He does everything the Father tells him to do. But in the end, he's on the outside looking in because there was no love in it. In the end, we realize he's keeping the rules because now he'll go to the Father and say, I was the good boy. You owe me now. And don't we do that with God? I'm going to be faithful to you. I'm going to do what I'm going to I'm going to stay in bounds morally. I'm going to give a little bit to the church. I'm going to attend church. I'm going to do this and that. Because in the end, you owe me, Lord, a good life. Because I'm the, I'm the good boy. This is where a football coach who lost yesterday gets up and said, no, actually, we won. I know they scored more points than we did, but they had nine penalties, and we only had five penalties. So we won. They broke the law a lot more than we did. So we're celebrating today. We need, a, we need an alternative, do we not? We need something and someone to come to ourselves and to people and say, I think I've got an idea you need to try out. It's the atonement of Jesus Christ. It's where the Son of God comes to heaven, fully divine, fully man. He lives this earth. He avoids all the potholes. Of, of the relativism, the legalism, and all the other things rampant in his day, and willingly gives his life as innocent to us, for us that are guilty, so that we can be purged by his love, so that we can be transformed into who he wants us to be. And so, our life will matter now. That's the alternative that our world needs, and the reason there's going to be a second location. And one day, Lord willing, there'll be a third location because this area is growing by leaps and bounds. And there's a lot of people that don't know that truth yet. They're accepting a fake gospel, a substitute form of truth. And so we need to be as busy as we can, as Jesus said, while it's still light because he also said the night is coming when no man can work and we don't want to be caught. So, how about Ephesians 3? I think today is a great day to remind ourselves or teach ourselves what the power of God's all about. We, all, we say that all the time. God's powerful, but I think sometimes we lose the zeal to, to take all that in. So, today's going to be a reminder, but a reinforcement of, no, He really is. He really is all-powerful, and therefore, He's unlimited. And here's where it's good for me and you. Our renewal is not limited. He's always needing to renew us. If we're in a covenant relationship, 
we're busted broken and he's perfect and holy, that's such a mismatch that there needs to be a daily renewal of our spirit so that we can be more who he's created us to be. The good news about that, according to verse 20 of Ephesians 3, that will be read later, is this renewal has no limits. The only limit is us and our um, ability to, to sidestep. Paul knew that in the First Testament. Paul was uniquely crafted to walk into the culture in the first century and say, I have an alternative you've not looked at. I have a better idea. It's not really my idea. So you ready? Let's, look, let's just look quickly at two limitless qualities of God that point to his awesome ability to have power. And so verses uh, 14 through 16 of Ephesians 3 is where we are. So the first one is the power of his spirit, capital S. That's the Holy Spirit, right? The power of his spirit. Let's read verses 14 through 16. For this reason, for what reason? Well, in verse 12 and 13, the context, verse 12, he says, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. He said, the pipeline is, is the personal relationship with Jesus Christ. As my wife Sherry said, I'm into a relationship and not a religion or a ritual. And he says, next verse, I'm in a hard place. You know who I am. I've been suffering, but it's not about me. It's about him. So then that's, that's his for this reason. He says, I kneel or I pray before the Father. Capital F, that means the Heavenly Father, that means God. That's back to our covenant theme for today. We are in this covenant, so you're a daughter or you're a son of God if you are a Christ follower. Verse 15, for whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Heaven and earth. Heaven, we're surrounded by, it says, an army of witnesses. There's people up there that are already, of course, there who were Christ followers, and they are one reason that we're maybe a little bit more mature. We've said goodbye to a lot of those old saints um, in this last year, and, and they had a profound influence on all of us, but also I think he's talking about the Trinity, one God, but three personages, this family in heaven. Verse 16, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power, there's our word, through the Spirit in your inner being. That's a capital S. Power, this word in the power uh, phrase in the Greek meant not earthly. We can't replicate it. We can't duplicate it. We can't facsimile this power because it comes from somewhere else. It's holy, just, pure, incorruptible, unmistakable, unlimited. He sends it to a believer who confesses Jesus, and he embeds it inside of our spirit. And so it's from somewhere else. It's not earthly in any fashion. It is strictly from heaven. And he says it comes into our inner being, which is our spirit. Now, y'all, what has to happen there initially, but also pretty much with me on a daily basis, as he is dwelling in me, I got to realize he needs to clean, clean me out of some things too, right? There needs to be a cleansing. It's one thing like we just did to say, I've been separated out to go somewhere and serve him. It's quite another to say, to be separated out, I need to come clean. I can't clean up myself, but you will have to do it through my confession and through my repentance. 2 Corinthians 4.16 is a great verse. Though our outward bodies are wasting away. That's pretty obvious to everybody, isn't it? Well, some of y'all, like me, got up this morning and, oh, something's not working yet. And, you know, this hurts and that. We're all getting those reminders. But he says the inward spirit is being renewed day by day. At the time we age, we can actually be more vibrant more alive in our inner spirit. And that's what he's referring to, and that's only the power of God. This gives us a lot of confidence because he says we can approach God anytime, any way, through his spirit as the intermediary, and it can happen. That's why we're part of a family. I heard about a kid came home from elementary school one day, and man, 
Everybody's in fat. He's got aunts and uncles from out of town there. There's this big gathering. They're cooking food. They've got this big cake and all. He said, what is going on? And they said, your father, you know, he, he was in the army. He said, he just got promoted to general. Isn't that great? So when he comes home, we're just going to have a big party to celebrate the fact that he's a general now. And the boy said, that's, that's all well and good, but can I still call him daddy? That's where we are. We're still the little children that at times we just need to make sure daddy's still here. And the good news of the gospel is he's not only here and living in you, he knows you, he knows where you are today, he sees you, he's got, he's got it. He's got it under control even when we do not. This is why prayer, as we've been talking about the last two Sundays, is so important. We have this amazing ability to connect even when we don't understand what's going on or even how to pray. Romans 8, 26, 27, mentioned it last week. There are times we do not know how to pray. But in that moment, the Holy Spirit takes over. And he goes to Jesus. Can you imagine this? The Trinity is having a conversation about you at this moment. And it's almost like the Spirit said, you know, he's, he's trying hard, but he's pretty ignorant. So here's what he's trying to ask for. Here's what he really needs. And Jesus himself says, so it shall be. So it shall be. That's the family that we are in covenant with. And he will strengthen your inner being. We have this amazing power. I love... Um, I love reminders of just things that I don't understand here on this earth. I love, I love the space program with NASA. A little bit disappointed yesterday. They were going to shoot off the Artemis, the new generation of rockets to go to the moon. Ultimately, may put people on Mars. And it's going to be, when it does go off, it's going to be the most powerful rocket ever launched by far. So I couldn't show you a clip of that. They scrubbed it yesterday. Can I show you one just to kind of give you a little feel for the moment from earlier, the discovery? Let's show that, guys. 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, start, two, one. Boost ignition and liftoff of the space shuttle Discovery, returning to the space station, paving the way for future missions beyond. Well, I get goosebumps every time I see that and, and hear that sound. As strong and powerful as that is the reminder of what we humans can do, I think every time, time one of those blasts off, God kind of giggles and he says, is that all you got? <laughs> is that the best you can do? Because I spoke and created everything you're in the middle of. I spoke and created those distant heavenly bodies that you've just now been able to see with your big telescopes. I created much of your earth that you have never even seen. No human has seen parts of this little globe we live in. To not speak of the, uni of the whole universe. And he spoke it into existence. He said the word and it happened. Now that is power. And that is the access to the Holy Spirit that we have now. Zechariah 4, 6, not by might, not by power, but by what? The Spirit, says the Lord. We have to stay involved with the dependence on the Holy Spirit. Because we're human, we're frail, we're sinners. That puts us, we jump the rails sometimes, and we start to depend on more visible things are emotionally feeling-based things, and they may be good things, but they become bad things because we make them idols. Everybody in this room, including me, have been an idol, uh, an idolatrous person before. 
We've all been there. We've all done it. That's when we start reaching for relativistic stuff or legalistic stuff. And that's when the power erodes right out of our life because the Holy Spirit is quenched by all of that. And then we wonder what's going on. That's why it is so important to have a system. And if, you, if yours is not working for you, experiment or go see somebody you respect and say, how can I attach myself, connect to God every single day in a meaningful, purposeful way through his word and through just my prayer with him, my communication with him. That has to happen for you to get to the point where you're fully able to bless the rest because none of us can produce fruit apart from the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said the evidence of your fruit is that you love me and you love other people. And, and we cannot do that if, if we're not. Um, a few years ago, I went to the upstate to a football game, and the uh, home team... Well, it's about halfway through the year. The home team was undefeated. And so there was a high amount of energy in the stadium. Everybody looking forward to the game, and the team they were playing was pretty good, but they were not as good. So the expectation was, you know, we'll knock them off. We'll continue to go. The only problem with that was the last play of the game, the other team lined up and kicked a field goal and beat them. The place is pandemonium, rah, roaring, and all of a sudden it's like graveyard quiet. I expected to see some people jumping off the upper deck and just like, it's over. End of the world. It was so quiet walking out, the guy behind me, I could hear him smacking his gum among thousands and thousands of people. And finally, a lady, she didn't say it to anybody in particular, a lady somewhere behind me, it was an election year, and she said, well, at least the right guy won the election the other day. And there's a few people say, yeah, that's right, and the energy level picked back up momentarily, and then settled back down. The reason I mention that is it's so easy to get into idols on this earth, and if something happens to, we're devastated. Oh, man, my team lost. It's the end of the world. They may not win the national championship now. All is lost. Well, no, we still have a little bit of left over here. The right guy won the election, but then four years later, he loses the election. And we're devastated again. If we are devastated by things that happen on this old earth, which are not perfect, not all-powerful, not omniscient, never were, no creative power in them, but if we've lashed ourselves to that wagon, we have a puny, fake version of the gospel with no power. And we're susceptible to whatever's going to happen tomorrow that disappoints us or whatever person disappoints us tomorrow. There's got to be a better plan. It's the power of His Spirit, and number two, the power of His love. Look at 17 through 19. So that Christ may dwell, that means permanently, in your hearts through faith. And I pray that being rooted and established in what? In love. You may have power together with all the saints. So He attaches our power on the inside with His love that we receive. Together with all the saints. You know what that's talking about? What James started talking about? What I said with covenant? Fellowship. Churches are created as a covenant community to come together in fellowship, which means mutual love, which is deep and probing and knowing. It's not surface level. It's not contrived. It's not intended to be among many gods. It is a singular devotion to Christ which is manifested in relationship to other people who are part of your family too. And he says that's where the real power is because then you can grasp how wide and long and high and deep is what? The love of Christ. Hebrews 7, 25 said he is certainly able, more than able, to do what he said he's going to do in your life. Basically, take away your sins, save you, put you on a high ground, and say, now, just follow me, and we'll take care of this. Verse 19, and we know the love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Verse 19, y'all, have you ever had one of those crashing, disappointing tragic days, and it just doesn't. What you thought 
you knew about God or heard from God is not what's happened. You ever had that happen? You told me this doesn't look like it. I thought your word said this. This is not what's going on right now. In that moment when we question God, there are sometimes, this happened to me before, to where he'll lead me to that verse, and he says, can I remind you of something? My love is deeper and higher than your knowledge is. So you're going to trust my love when you can't understand what's going on around me. He's done to me, maybe to you, what he did to Job a couple of times when he said, who are you? to question what I'm about to do here. Remember, Job, where were you when I hung the stars? Where were you when I turned the water on and filled all the oceans with it and all? <laughs> Who are you to pretend that you can figure me out, is what he's saying. Because his love is so powerful, it actually unifies if you find a group of people, I don't care if it's in the marketplace, it's in a biological family, it's in a church, another nonprofit, a neighborhood, HO, I don't care what the setting is in the organization. If you find a group that are bound together in love, you have a tremendous unity that really no other outside force can even, can even break up if you don't allow it. And here's the incredible thing. The sum is greater than the parts. Let me explain. See, at times there'll be a CEO of a big company, and he's just a rock star. He's taking a struggling company to, like, they're worth $18 billion, and everybody's like, he's the greatest leader in the world. And then there'll be another really big struggling company over here. They're about to take a nosedive, and he will agree to a new challenge. I'll leave here, and I'll resurrect this one like I did that one, and he falls on his face. Same guy, same talent, same intellect, same experience. He goes over here, and he fails. Why is that? Many times, the sum is greater than the parts. This was a great fit for him. The chemistry was right. The culture was right. Over here, it was not the case, and he didn't make it. We see that in sports teams. We see that in churches. The sum is always greater than the parts. And the reason behind that, I think, is the, is the unbelievable love of God, that we cannot, we cannot wrap our hands around, we cannot adequately define it, but we know it when we see it. So let me, let me define it real quickly because there's 119 definitions of love in our culture today, and about 100 of them are absolutely wrong. They have nothing to do with love. But God, we know through the Scripture, is number one, it's a principled love. In Isaiah 45, 19, in Isaiah 45, 19, he says, I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. He says, I don't care what you're being told on social media. I don't care what your neighbor says, I determine what is true. I determine what is right. It's a principled love. I'm going to love inside this boundary. He will always love you, but he might not always love your actions. Romans 12, 12, 19, I believe it is, 12, 21 says, we should love the good and hate the evil. We don't hate people, but we hate the evil that reigns inside of some people. And that's exactly what God does because it's a principle to love. I'm going to love this, but I'm not going to love that. Never will. It's also patient. Exodus 34, 6, Moses' patience had run out. That's when he looks up at God and says, I've got a daycare going on here. I've got two million people of a, in adult daycare is what I have. And God says, I can tell your patience is about to run out. But he says, I am slow to anger. He says, I'm going to hang in there with them a little while longer. And I love you, so that will enable you to hang in there with them a little while longer, too. He is patient. He's not willing for anyone to perish. He does have a limit to his patience. But I, for one, should be on my knees right now thanking him how patient he is with me. And maybe you are in that same boat. The third thing, he's, he's principled, he's patient, he's also passionate. Isaiah talks about the zeal of the Lord. 
He's pretty fired up about what He wants to do in your life. He's pretty committed to it. He sold out on it. There's never a day that He does not care about you and your life. And many times we need a reminder of that, of how passionate He really is. What about justice, Randy? I get that all the time. If God was just, why did this happen? Why do children suffer? Why do people die of leukemia at 10 years old who are good people and all like that? What is just about that? One writer, Fletcher, theologian Fletcher, said justice is a distribution of his love. He, he loves us some days by executing justice. In the end, when Jesus comes back again, we read that that's absolutely what will happen. All the sheep over here, all the goats over here, you've had plenty of opportunities. I've got to be just now. I've got to balance the scales. And so there's got to be a group that goes to a fantastic reward, and there must be some that get truly what they deserve. We all deserve that, but this group never claimed the pardon of Jesus Christ. And that's the separating part about justice. Tim Keller uh, wrote, and I thought this was so good, he said, God, here's a reminder, y'all, God doesn't love you because you're so lovely. God loves you because He's lovely, and He's going to try to change you to be lovely. That's what it's all about. That's the real power of His Spirit and power of His love. I'm going to love the ugliness out of you if you'll just let me. And that's a, that, I think that's the thing we all ought to take him up on. His renewal today is unlimited. He can take anything and he can, re, and he can make it transformed because we're in a covenant with him. Can I ask you a personal thing now? Are you willing today to lay aside your neediness and let him melt that away and replace it with his perfect love. Well, I'm not needy, Randy. Oh, come on. <laughs> we all have our days of neediness. We all have our moments where it shifts to be about us, and we feel sorry for ourselves, and we, why do I have to go through this? Y'all, that's called needy. It doesn't make you a terrible, awful reprobate. It just gets in the way of God's power of his spirit and his love. And he would like to melt that away because you know what? To a lot of people on the outside looking in, it's ugly. And he says, you know, I can kind of, I can take that away. And then it's going to be about other people and blessing the rest. And in the event that you sacrifice for me and you love each other in the way that I tell you to and show you to, other people are going to look at you and say, that's the most powerful lady on the block. Because why? She's not needy. He can take that too away from us. He will change your world. I told you I love the space program. Um, I want to show you or let you hear a little exchange that happened not too long ago, but I got to set it up first. Middle of the night, it's two in the morning. A guy in England burst into his eight year old daughter's room, wakes her up, scares her to death, and he said, I got through. I've got him. You want to come? And she bolts out of bed. She goes into a room with a ham radio, and he puts, a head, puts headphones on her and a mic in her hands, and this is what, this is what you're about to hear. Fiera, Fiera, Mike Zero, Lima, Mike Kilo. Mike Zero, Lima, Mike. Call sign, say again for anyone at that. Mike Zero, Lima, Mike Kilo. Mike Zero Lima, Mike Kilo, this is NA1SS. Welcome to the International Space Station. November Alpha 1, Sierra Sierra. Mike Zero Lima, Mike Kilo. My name is Isabella. I'm eight years old. You're five or nine. Thank you. Mike Zero Lima, Mike Kilo, this is November Alpha 1, Sierra Sierra. Isabella, it's uh, so great to chat with you. Thank you for getting on the radio and saying hello. Thank you, Fly, fly Safe. Thank you, Isabella. Seven threes. You know, um, I didn't know it was possible to do that. 
if that thing is overhead where you are at the right time of day and you're a ham operator and you know how to get on the frequency, I guess, and everything, you actually can talk to somebody in outer space. Even if you're eight years old. The dad said after that in an interview, he said, that changed my daughter's world. Probably so, temporarily. But the God who loves you and created all of that and so much more says, I can change it forever. Matter of fact, I'll do better. I'll give you a new life. And then I'm going to hang around inside of you, and you don't need a ham radio. You don't need any operator. 24-7, all you got to do is cry out to me because I already see you. I already know you. I already know what you're going to say before you say it, but I'm waiting to hear. And if you don't get it right, my spirit will help you. And if you're still struggling, my son will stand up from his throne and we'll have a little discussion about you and about what will make you more like him because there's your standard to be like Christ. And if you're willing for that journey, for that adventure, you'll never be without purpose, you'll never be without meaning, and you'll never be without an audience. So drive safe. Why don't you stand, and uh, we'll see you down front.